Nelson Mandela, the man behind the revival of South African Republic, is the icon of moral conduct. He was the longest detained political prisoner of the world, who, after his release, went on to become the first black president of an independent nation. He is the most high-spirited, most unbending, and the most defiant leader of all times. He is the preacher and practitioner of indulgence in community, betterment, and selfless service to the nation. Nelson Mandela was born on July 18, 1918 AD in South Africa. His birth name was Rohella, which literally means troublemaker. Mandela's father, Henry, was a royal chief, both by blood and costume. By blood, his father, Henry, was the descendant of the royal family of Tenbu tribe, and by costume, his father, Henry, was confirmed as the local magistrate by the prevailing British rule. Mandela was Henry's son from his third wife. His father, being a chief, had the privilege of getting married to four women, each of whom belonged to different clans of Kosa. Mandela was the eldest of the children from Fanny, the third wife, and the youngest of the four sons from all four wives. During the time when Mandela was still a newborn child, his father was removed from the chiefmanship as the local magistrate. His father, Henry, refused the higher grade magistrate and such a death was not expected of the blacks during those times. At the age of five in 1923 AD, Nelson Mandela became a herd boy looking after the cattle and fells. During the British reign, there were many African households who got converted into Christians. Mandela also baptized and migrated to the more advanced section of the community. On the first day of the school, as a ritual, all the baptized children were rendered a new English name for the ease of pronunciation and recognition. The first name that preceded Mandela now changed from Rolilala to Nelson. On the first day of his school, he became Nelson Mandela. In 1927 AD, when Nelson Mandela was 9 years old, his father died of acute chronic cough. Mandela and his mother had to pack their bags again and depart from their native village, Kunu. Mandela's mother took him to the great place, palace at Mek Ijiweni, where he was entrusted to the guardianship of Tembu regent, Chief Jongin Taba Dailen Debu. Mandela was left by her mother under the guidance and care of Tembu regent, Chief Jongin Taiba Dailen Debu. The regent and his wife used to treat Mandela as their own child. He was raised with complete fairness and was given equal rights and liberty as their own son, Justice. Justice, who was the regent's real son, was four years older than Mandela. When Mandela turned 19 in 1937 AD, he was sent to Helltown, the Wesleyan College, and studied justice. He tried his hand at long-distance running and boxing. For the young blacks during that time, Fort Hare was equivalent to Cambria and Oxford. Finally, after successfully clearing the interview at Fort Hare, Mandela, at 21 years of age, started his academics for the university degree of BA. Although remaining under the grip of the whites was what the blacks had to do at that time, still, a jolt of strength and valor was experienced by Mandela when he had his first experience of standing up against the laws. Fort Hare seniors had the policy of keeping the freshman year students from being a part of house committee, which was unacceptable to the fresher. Mandela, being one of the new students, felt that the college authorities should know about the undue supremacy of the senior students. The matter was brought forth to the college management and the freshman students got the final decision in their favor. This first battle against the status quo ignited the feeling of confidence in Mandela which made him strive more and more for justice and equality in the years to come. At Fort Hare, he mastered both soccer and cross-country running, perfected ballroom dancing and became a member of a student Christians association. A person who considered this BA degree to be imprimitive for his entry into the real world, chose to quit his education solely due to his ethics and morale. He had been elected 
as the nominee for the election of the Students' Council at Fort Hare, but as a matter of principle, he boycotted this election due to the pile of unheard grievances of the students. Since this did was a pure act of rebellion as per the university norms, he was presented a choice by the dean to either accept the nomination or get dismissed from the university. After a whole sleepless night of contemplation, Mandela walked in the dean's office next morning with his backpacks ready to leave the institution. In 1939-80, his garden father, the regent, had invited both his boys to inform them that he had arranged marital alliance for them. The news took both of the brothers by shock. Neither Mandela nor his brother Justice was ready for the marriage. After hearing the final words that came out of the regent's mouth, both of brothers decided to escape from home. Immediately after reaching Johannesburg, Justice and Mandela devised some alternatives and started working. Mandela took up the job of a night guard in a gold mines. The initial days of their stay in the city were joyous and fulfilling. Both of the brothers had enough money and jobs that were seemingly permanent. But as soon as their boss knew that they escaped from their house, the boss kicked both Justice and Mandela out of their respective jobs. In 1941, his garden, the regent, died. In 1942, Mandela passed his final exams for the BA degree. As time went by, Mandela became more and more involved in social activities. He enjoyed being a listener to the lively debates and discussion at the African National Congress ANC meetings. By the beginning of 1943-80, Mandela had returned to Johannesburg to start with his Bachelor in Law at the University of Witwatersland. In 1943-80, Mandela became an active participant of the ANC's activities and meetings. He marched for the first time with Gaur Rabedi and thousands of others for protesting against the hike and bus fare in Alexandra. It was in 1944 AD that the actual formation of the Youth League took place. This wing of African National Congress, ANC, had a very clear agenda and motives. They believed that no one but Africans themselves could bring back their national liberty. In 1945, Mandela's first son, Madiba Tembekeli, was born. In 1946, the great mine workers' strike broke out which involved more than 70,000 mine workers who revolted against the mine's policy of lower wages to their workers. These movements were fully supported by African National Congress, ANC. Impressed by Mandela's relentless work towards the betterment of ANCYL, African National Congress Youth League, Mandela was appointed as the National Secretary in 1948 AD. However, in South Africa, the policy of apartheid was started to get implemented across the nation, segregating the whites from the blacks. Harsh and prejudiced policies and reforms like the Mixed Marriages Act, holding the people who marry between a different race punishable, the Immorality Act, making sexual relations between whites and non-whites illegal, and the Population and Restriction Act, labeling the countryman by race, the sole arbiter of that individual, were being introduced. At the 1949 annual conference, a plan of action was prepared by the Youth League on the lines of Gandhian protests in India, which advocated the weapons of non-violence like boycott, strike, civil disobedience, and non-cooperation. In 1952, the African National Congress Youth League ANCYL, decided to hold demonstration as a measure to revolve against the prevailing government. This tape was more formally named as a campaign of defiance of unjust laws. On the first day of defiance campaign, there were 250 people who participated in the rallies and as a result were sent to prison. In the next five months, people from different fields like doctors, lawyers, teachers, students, ministers, everyone became a part of this rebellion. During those six months of defiance campaign, Mandela traveled a lot. 
He often indulged in introducing the agenda and motif of ANC to his rural countrymen. One more thing which Mandela took interest in during those times was his practice as an attorney and in August 1952, he started his own law firm. After the defiance campaign broke out, Mandela and few of his co-ANC members were banned from appearing in public gatherings, meetings and any sort of appearance amongst the masses. Now that ANC meetings were no longer a part of his schedule, he amassed a lot of free time which he utilized for his practice as an attorney. On 5th December 1956, Mandela was arrested by the South African police under the charge of treason. Within the next 168 hours, other allies of Mandela were also under arrest. There were a total of 156 political prisoners. All of them were soon moved to Johannesburg prison, popularly known as the Fort. They were detained in the fort for two more weeks during which they successfully converted their communal cell into a conventional for the freedom fighters. What came as an opportunity in adversity was that ANC supporters from different parts of Africa were coming in together at the fort and the place became more like a hub for the delivery and exchange of ideas and visions. They were all accused guilty for their participation in a countrywide conspiracy generating movement like the defiance campaign. If the allies were found guilty, their punishment would be death. Months and months passed by and the decision would never get announced. After his bail, Mandela reached home to find it vacuum. His wife, Miss, had left along with the kids and in 1957, after four children and 13 years of marriage, the couple divorced. His wife, Miss, could no longer take his absence at home and his devotion to revolutionary agitation. In the year 1958, Mandela came across Nam Jamo Winifred Mandikajelia, more often referred to as Winnie. Winnie was the first black female social worker at Barangwat Hospital. She and Mandela had first made to resolve some legal matters concerning Winnie's family, but it was apparent from their elongated conversation and their recurrent meetings that they were getting fond of each other. Mandela decided to marry Winnie. The wedding took place on 14 June 1958. Their first daughter, Jenani, was born the very next year in 1959. On 3rd August 1959, after an ordeal of two years and eight months, all the accused, including Mandela, were declared non-guilty and freed from all the charges that were built against them. But again, the South African government segregated the whites and blacks more distinctively and brutally. There were a number of protests that erupted in various parts of Africa like Pondoland and Tembuland and a lot of ANC supporters were killed. The agitation among the people had risen so high that the new organization called the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress, came into being. Although the manifesto and motives of the PSC were not too different from that of the ANC, it succeeded in easing out the application of apartheid for the government at large as many of the ANC supporters had now acuted to the PSC, leaving ANC weak and confused. Jen G, Nelson's second daughter, was born in 1960. The year 1960 was a particularly cursed year for Africa as it memorized transported the Africans back to Sarfville massacre. Sarfville was a small locality chosen by the PSC activists to conduct demonstration against the growing dictatorship of the government. The PSC comrades were peaceful in their conduct and all of them were indiscriminatingly unarmed. However, in a spur of the moment, during their protest, the police opened fire on the helpless, defenseless protester. The legal riot took as many as 69 innocent lives and injured more than 400 South Africans. The stock markets plunged and the immigration counts kept on rising. Even the white natives were afraid of staying in Africa. 
the matters became so worse that United National Security Council intervened in the African government's affair and criticized it greatly for their unorganized rule. There were a lot of anti-apartheid movements and demonstrations as an aftermath of this mournful happening. On 20th March, a crowd of over 50,000 Africans gathered in Cape Town in support of the disease. But as a result, the government turned as devious as it could get. A state of emergency was declared and sweeping power against all forms of subversion were granted to the police. On 30th March, Nelson Mandela was again arrested without a warrant as a political criminal along with the other members of PSC and ANC. All the accused were made to live in terrible conditions while they were detained. Firstly, they were kept devoid of food and water for 18 long hours after they were imprisoned and secondly, the cells and the so-called basic amenities like sanitation, food and clothing were in such a filthy and foul state. Both ANC and PSC were declared as illegal organizations under the suppression of Communism Act. The trauma continued for one whole year until the emergency was lifted. On 29th March 1961, it was finally declared in the trial that ANC officials were not guilty and as a result, all the arrested were discharged. After the release, ANC and Mandela became more cautious regarding their alternatives to finding ways and means to acquire freedom. Mandela remained underground for most part of the early 1960s. Nelson Mandela was forced to live apart from his family as he was always on a move and had to adopt a number of disguises. He was a laborer in one instance, a chauffeur in another, and a gardener in the next. His successful attempts at fooling the police every time earned him the title of the Black Pimpernel. Since 50 years till the 1960s, non-violence was the core driving principle of the ANC, but with the rising atrocities of the government, the ANC decided that henceforth it would be recognized under a different light. The ANC then adopted the path of organized violence. Mandela and the rest of the ANC agreed upon four types of violent activities, that is, sabotage, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, and open revolution. While performing the deeds of destruction, leaflets were also circulated at varied junctures. They spoke about their activities and carried out organized attacks on government bodies, particularly those who had greater and deep-rooted connected with the apartheid policies. The date was 16 December 1961 and the whites were celebrating the triumph of the Afrikaners over the Africans. The explosion that happened on that day took the African government by total shock. In early 1962, Mandela left the country under the pseudonym David Mochiai Mai and traveled abroad for several months. He attended and addressed various political gatherings and meetings during that time in Ethiopia and Central Africa and was appreciated by the senior political leaders in several countries like Tanganyika, Senegal, Ghana and Sierra Leone. He also spent time in London where he was united with many exiled comrades including Oliver Tambo, his closest and most trusted friend over the years. During this time, Winnie Mandela's second wife was facing a tough time coping with the unalarmed and untimely visits of the cops at her home, relentlessly questioning her about the track of Mandela's escape. Finally, in the August of 1962, Mandela decided to let his guard down and reach Johannesburg. As clear as it was, the police had sealed every corner of the places where Mandela was suspected to visit once he reached back in town and it was on August 5th, 1962 when Mandela was once again arrested. Mandela was convicted and sentenced to five years imprisonment. He was transferred to Rowan Island in May 1963. Mandela believed that prison not only robs you of your freedom, it attempts to take away your identity. As a freedom fighter and as a man 
one must fight against the prison's attempt to rob one of these qualities. As a man guided by his defiance and individualism, Mandela operates numerous laws and codes as a criminal under arrest too. Initially, he denied wearing shirts as the uniform on Robben Island as he believed that he was a political prisoner and the latter were supposed to be treated with a little difference even though in jail. He was strong-headed about his conditions right from the beginning and although compromising at one or other situation, he managed to stay in the prison comfortably. On 1st May 1963, the government introduced much stricter apartheid laws. It brought on the 90 days detention law which gave any Polish officer the right to detain any person without a warrant on the grounds of being suspect of any political crime. Soon after these reforms, the news regarding the savage treatment of prisoners started flowing in from different parts of Africa. The prisoners were reportedly victimized of electric shocks, suffocation and other forms of inhuman tortures. Towards the end of May, Mandela along with some other prisoners was brought back to Pretoria. The authorities issued a statement citing the reasons for Mandela's shift as the means to protect the later of the PSC assault in the island but it was clear to all that the government had its own selfish motives in bringing him back. They needed to keep him isolated so much that even his breathing could not communicate any kind of message to anyone. On October 9, 1963, Mandela along with the other prisoners was taken to the Palace of Justice in Pretoria for what came to be known as the Rivonia Trial. Unlike the treason trial, this time the accused were charged of sabotage and conspiracy. The accused, Mandela, were not given a death penalty but a life imprisonment. The 46 years old Nelson Mandela was deported back to Robben Island where he spent 27 years of his life in prison. Mandela was parted away from all his comrades, his family and his countrymen for 27 long years. He recalls his experience in the Robel Island as the darkest part of his life, but even there, he remained too proud and legitimate to give up and accept defeat. Even in prison, the criminals were grouped into the categories A, B, C and D to maintain a hierarchy amongst them. As a Group D prisoner, Mandela had acquired the right to have only one visit, write and receive only one letter during a period of six months. In the spring of 1968, Mandela was paid a visit by his mother in the Robben Island. His mother, as Mandela later recalls, had become sick when she visited him. He knew that he was the partly the reason behind her ill health. A few weeks later, Mandela was informed by a telegram at the head office that his mother had passed away. He tried all means to get a bail to go and arrange for his mother's funeral, the utmost duty of a son, but being a repulsive prisoner, his plea was denied. Later in 1969, Mandela got the news of his wife being arrested without warrant under the Terrorism Act. All the bad news that were piling and from different spheres of his life were getting too hard to process when the most devastating loss was intimated to Mandela. He received a telegram from his youngest son, Magato, telling him in just one statement that his eldest son, Tembi, had died in a car crash. This tragedy was just too much for even a strong man like Mandela to get over with. Years went by and even as a prisoner, Mandela tried all resort to bring the ANC back in action after his release. He would often find opportunities to resolve the differences between the ANC and PSC in midst to bring them together and stand firmly against the bigger evil, the government. Mandela and others rejected an offer of their freedom on the condition of surrendering violent practice. To this proposed extent, he blandly responded, prisoners cannot enter into contracts. Only free men can negotiate. Mandela was still in prison when his daughter Jenani was married to Prince Tumbumoji Dalmini in 1973 
elder brother of King Matswati III of Swaziland. South African authorities did not permit her to visit Mandela. In March 1982, after 18 years, Mandela was transferred to a single cell of Polsmoor Prison in Cape Town. In December 1988, Mandela was moved to the Victor Verster Prison near Paul. In 1989, Mr. De Klerk, member of the Nationalist Party, became the President of the South African Republic. Klerk was not only a man of his own rules, but also a pragmatic and thoughtful leader. Soon after Klerk became the President, things started changing. The ANC members were released from their imprisonment. At 3.30 p.m. on February 11, 1990, Mandela was released free of all the charges and cases filed against him. Nelson Mandela was 72 when he was released. But despite being so badly treated, he did not want to take any revenge on those responsible for apartheid. He wanted blacks and whites to live in harmony and to build a better future together. In 1991, the first national conference of the ANC was held and Nelson Mandela was elected the president of ANC. Mandela's life that involved continuous trial of the undying human spirit became the roadmap of life for many young achievers to come. With due pride and glory, Nelson Mandela accepted the 1993 Nobel Peace Prize for all those South Africans who suffered and sacrificed but still stood by him and his ideologies at the most critical of all situations. Mandela received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 for peacefully destroying the apartheid regime and laying the foundation for democracy. In addition to the Nobel Peace Prize, he won over 250 other awards. The era of the vicious apartheid officially ended on April 27, 1994, when Nelson Mandela voted for the first time in his life, along with his people, the whole nation. Rolihalala Nelson Dalibunga Mandela was inaugurated as President of a Democratic South Africa on May 10, 1994. As President, Nelson Mandela donated half of his salary to poor children and when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, he gave part of the prize money to help street children. Nelson Mandela was the president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. He was the first black president of South Africa and the first president to be elected in a fully representative election. Nelson Mandela's government focused on destroying the apartheid government in the country, which had focused on racial segregation enforced by the law. Meanwhile, on the personal front, due to political estrangement, his marriage with Wenny ended in March 1996. Mandela married for the third time on his 80th birthday, July 18, 1998. He married Grasa Machel, widow of Samora Machel, the former Mozambican president an ANC ally who was killed in an air crash 12 years earlier. Mandela relinquished his presidency in 1999 after his singular term as president, but there has been no retirement for this man. He set up three foundations bearing his name, the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, and the Mandela Roads Foundation. His schedule would jam pack over the years, raising money for his foundation to build schools and clinics in South Africa, rural heartland, and serving as a mediator in Burundi's civil war. He also published a number of books on his life and struggle, the most popular among them being No Easy Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela, The Struggle is My Life, Nelson Mandela's favorite African folk tales. In 2001, he was diagnosed and treated for prostate cancer. In June 2004, at the age of 85, Nelson Mandela announced his formal retirement from all the offices and his public life. He returned back to his native village Kunu and adopted the lifestyle of his tribe as he was supposed to do long back. In 2005, after his son's death due to AIDS, Mandela committed himself to the cause of fighting against the scene. 
after suffering from a prolonged respiratory infection. Mandela died on 5th December 2013 at the age of 95 at around 2050 local time at his home in Hoktong, surrounded by his family. Although his struggle as a black born continued for a greater part of his life, Nelson Mandela never judged or discriminated any white organization or individual. He never compromised his devotion to democracy, equality and learning. Despite terrible provocation, he never became a racist. His life has been an inspiration not only to the people in South Africa, but throughout the world. Knowing him makes you realize that no darkness is too dark to scum your faith and courage too. There will always be a ray of hope. You just need to strive long enough to find it glowing. Thank you.